are going to get into our study, but before we do, uh, we are going to um, pray once again. Father, we thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for your word. Um, I pray for the gift of teaching and a fresh filling of your Holy Spirit. And I pray, Lord, that uh, you'll help each and every one of us who are here to have a greater insight, deeper insight uh, to what you have to say in your word tonight. Help us to apply it with the help of your spirit. And may you equip us and encourage us through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So in our last study in 1 Samuel chapter 18, verses 17 through 30, we saw King Saul's evil schemes behind the scenes to have David killed. And in this study tonight, we're going to see that Saul is going to be open, not behind the scenes now, but he's going to be open with his plan to kill David. And so we're going to look at 1 Samuel 19. And as usual, we do have a title uh, for the message. And the title is Hated Without a Cause. Hated Without a Cause. And so we'll look at verse 1 in 1 Samuel 19. And it says, Now Saul spoke to Jonathan, his son, and to all his servants that they should kill David. But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted greatly in David. And so he loved David, of course, like a brother. But we see in this first verse that Saul wanted to get others involved in his plot to kill David. And that just reminds me of uh, the way some people are today, not just today, but we've seen it in the past because we have scriptures about it. But the way some people are today is that they also try to involve others in their sin. Doesn't matter which sin it is. They try to get people to either go with them and, and do that sin, which is a sin of commission, or they may try to get people to not do something that they should do, which is a sin of omission, or they may just uh, try to switch people's thinking from what is a biblical type of thinking to a sinful type of thinking. And so overall, some try to involve others in their sin, just like King Saul did in this very first verse. But what we should do as believers is follow the advice of the Holy Spirit that he gave through King Solomon, King David's son. And so in Proverbs chapter 1, verses 10 through 16, we see this advice. And it says, my son... If sinners entice you, do not consent. Don't agree with them. Don't go with them. If they say, come with us, let us lie in wait to shed blood. Let us lurk secretly for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them alive like Sheol, which is talking about the grave or the realm of the dead, and whole like those who go down to the pit. They said, we shall find all kinds of precious possessions in verse 13. We shall fill our houses with spoil. And it says, cast in your lot among us. Let us all have one purse. And so these are the people who want to do evil, trying to um, get, for example, uh, Solomon's son to um, go with them to shed innocent blood. And so here he's speaking to his son. But again, this is for all of us. This is, once again, from the Holy Spirit through King Solomon. And so he says, casting your lot among us, verse 14, let us all have one purse. My son, do not walk in the way with them. Keep your foot from their path, for their feet run to evil, and they should make haste to shed blood. So the Holy Spirit through King Solomon. And so that's what we see. So don't go with them. Don't consent with sinners to do evil. Those who practice sin, don't go along with them. Don't go along even with their type of thinking. And so in verses 2 and 3, it says, so Jonathan told David saying, my father Saul seeks to kill you. Therefore, please be on your guard until morning and stay in a secret place and hide. And I will go out and stand beside my father in the field where you are. And I will speak with my father about you. Then what I observe, what I find out, 
I will tell you. And so Jonathan, David's best friend here, is trying to protect him. He said, I'm going to figure out what's going on with my father Saul because he wants to kill you. And so stay in, and this is the note here I want to focus on, stay in a secret place and hide. And I want to focus on that phrase there because the best place that we can hide is in the Lord. And so praise God that we have a hiding place. And yes, some people, they run home, they run to their closets, they, they find shelter. Some people in various buildings when there's danger present. And those things are practical, but the best place for us to hide as believers is, of course, in the Lord. And for a witness there, I'd like to turn to Psalm 31 and look at verses 19 and 20. And there you'll see that the word of God says, Oh, how great is your goodness, God's goodness, which you have laid up for those who fear you. And I like how one pastor puts it, how one Bible scholar uh, puts fear. Because, of, no, of course, we know that it's reverential all for the Lord. But I like the way that one preacher says it. He says that means that we take God seriously. And so he has laid up goodness for those who take God seriously, for those who have reverential all for the Lord. It says, which you have prepared for those who trust in you in the presence of the sons of men. And look at verse 20, it says, you shall hide them in the secret place of your presence from the plots, or guess what? The last study, the schemes of men. You shall keep them secretly in a pavilion or shelter them from the strife of tongues or from those contentious or accusing tongues. And so the best hiding place for us is in the Lord's presence. Now, I just want to throw it out there tonight. Is that where we are? I know many of us have trials. We have troubles and, and those things are on our mind. But we can find, we can find that, that secret, that, that hiding place in the Lord from the plots or schemes of men or even of the enemy, the devil. In verse 4, it says, Then Jonathan spoke well of, or he said good things about David to Saul, his father. And he said to him, Let not the king sin against his servant, against David, because he has not sinned against you, and because his works have been very good towards you. In other words, Jonathan is saying, uh, uh, David's works have been uh, a great advantage to you. For he took his life in his hands and he killed the Philistine. And it's speaking of Goliath. And the Lord brought about a great deliverance for all Israel. He said, you saw it and rejoice. Why then will you sin against innocent blood to kill David without a cause? And so Saul heeded the voice or the advice of Jonathan and Saul swore or promised that as the Lord lives, he shall not be killed. And then Jonathan called David and Jonathan told him all these things. And so Jonathan brought David to Saul and he was in his presence as in times past. Because remember, David played music. He played the harp or the lyre. Uh, for King Saul when he was distressed by the evil spirit that the Lord allowed to come upon him. But what we see here in these verses, and I love this so much about Jonathan, King Saul's son, is that he played the role of a peacemaker between David and his father Saul. And that brings up a question in my mind that I want to pose really to all of us. And that question is, when was the last time that we played the role of peacemaker? You see, there's many people who like to gossip or, or they like to be in this group versus that group. And so uh, even in church, unfortunately, there are little cliques that evolve and they come about. And the, this group is against this group, this clique against this clique. But when was the last time we played the role of peacemaker? When was the last time, in other words, we 
were a Jonathan. See, in Matthew 5, verse 9, I like what the scriptures say because this is from Jesus. He's given the sermon on the mount. So here is a beatitude. He says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. So, Pastor Durrell, I thought that you couldn't earn salvation. This is not talking about how you earn salvation or earn your way into becoming a child or a son of God. But this is just describing the, the attitude, so to speak, or the, life, the lifestyle of one who has already placed their faith in Christ. And we know from the scriptures, according to John chapter 1, that the only way to become a child of God is through faith in Christ. For as many as received him, to them he has given the right to become a child of of God. And just because someone is related to a Christian, just because somebody is a descendant of Adam, who is all of our human ancestor, of course, and we're related to Eve, just because that's the case doesn't mean we are a child of God. We are born. We must be born into the family. And it's to those who have received Jesus Christ as personal Savior and Lord to them. Once again, he has given us the right to become a child of God. And so if you repent it and you put your trust in Jesus, if that's you tonight, you are a child of God. You are a son of God. You are a daughter of God. And, and this here, what we see in Matthew 5, 9, blessed are the peacemaker. This is once again describing the characteristic of a true, true child of God. So when was the last time we played the role of a peacemaker? And why is it that when we manifest ourselves as peacemakers, why is it that we show ourselves to be a child of God? And I believe it's because of the fact that our father is a peacemaker. Well, well, how so? How is God the father of peacemaker? Well, it's because of sin, first of all, because of sin that separates us from God the father. We are at odds with him, not because of something God did, but because of our sin. It separated us from God, and so we are not at peace with God before receiving Jesus. But our father is a peacemaker, and to present the opportunity of peace, he sent Jesus to die for our sins. He, he sent Jesus to bridge that gap between man and God, that bridge that was caused by sin. And so Jesus, once again, is the bridge, and he gives us all the opportunity to have peace with God the Father. But the Father, the Scriptures tell us, he sent the Son, for He so loved the world that He decided, He chose to give His only begotten Son, His unique Son is what it's talking about when it's speaking of begotten Son. Not, not that he, he came from God, the Father's body or anything like that, but when it speaks of Jesus as the Son of God, it's, it's speaking of His, his, his role. It's speaking of uh, the fact that whatever makes God the Father of God, Jesus has it. And so that's why when Jesus said that God is his Father, when he, when he was talking to the Pharisees, they took that to mean that he was saying that, that he has the same DNA, if you will, as the Father, which would make him God. And so by him saying he's the Son of God, they wanted to stone him. They thought it was blasphemy. And so God the Father sent the only begotten son, so that we would have an opportunity to have peace with him. And as it says in Romans 5, 1, most of you had a chance to look at it by now, it says, therefore, having been justified by faith, having been declared righteous or having a right standing with God the Father, by what? By faith. Because, 
Because now we're looked upon as no longer guilty. And, and now we're not on our way to hell. Not only that, but we have the righteousness of Christ imputed into our spiritual account. And so it's, all of that is wrapped up in the justified. Justified never, never sin. And so we are justified by faith. Faith in Christ Jesus. And because of that, we have peace with God. Peace with God who? God the Father through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so blessed are the peacemaker. Happy are the peacemakers for they shall be called the sons of God because we are demonstrating a characteristic that God has as a peacemaker. Just like Jonathan in our lesson in, in verse 8 it says, And there was war again. David went out and he fought with the Philistines and he struck them with a mighty blow. And they fled from him. And now the distressing spirit from the Lord came upon Saul as he sat in his house or palace with his spear in his hand. And David was playing music with his hand. And then Saul sought to pin David to the wall with the spear. So Jonathan acted as a peacemaker and got and brought David back into the palace to play music for his father. But we see what Saul is doing here. He, he sought to pin David to the wall with the spear, verse 10, but he slipped away from Saul's presence and he drove the spear into the wall. And so David fled and he escaped that night. And so what we see here in these verses is that David fought a battle on the outside and then he was attacked on the inside. And we too experience those battles out in the world. We experience and go through those external battles, those outward battles. But also many of us face those attacks in private. We also are attacked inwardly. Maybe uh, it's mentally. Maybe it's emotionally. But we all experience those attacks in private as well as externally. And in verse 11, it says that Saul also sent messengers. He sent his agents or soldiers to David's house to watch him and kill him in the morning. And Michal, David's wife, told David, saying, if you do not save your life tonight, tomorrow you will be killed. And so Michal let David down through a window and he went and fled and escaped. And in verse 13, and Michal took an image or an household idol, which I don't believe belonged to David. And, and she laid it in the bed, put a cover of goat's hair for his head, and, he, and she covered it with clothes. And so when Saul sent messengers or agents to take David, she said that, hey, David is sick. And so this experience that we see in these verses, in verses 11 through 14, of course, this would have an effect on David. And, and it would have so much of an effect on David we have Psalm number 59 to read. And so if you read Psalm 59 in your private time, you're going to see him talk about this experience here that we're looking at tonight. But I want to talk about my call. I want to talk about David's wife, who also happens to be Saul's daughter. And I want to mention her tonight or uh, take a a break here tonight or park here tonight as some would say to talk about her because we see that she was used to help save David and that's a blessing to me because many times God will use our wives to help us and perhaps save us from dangerous situations and so we may want to make a decision that may be harmful to us and to the family and the Lord. The Holy Spirit will give some wisdom to our wives, but we have to be humble enough to listen to our wives in those cases if the Holy Spirit is speaking to them because sometimes their advice to us can save us from a dangerous situation. Uh, just like what we see here with Michael and David as she helped him to escape the, the, this this murder that could have taken place. And so thank God for our wives. But husbands, are we, are we humble enough to listen when the Lord 
gives our, gives our wives some godly advice. And I know we're the head of the household. I know we're the priest of the home, but we're not the only ones in the household who are saved and have the Holy Spirit and dwell in us. Though the Lord could even use our children, our saved children who have the Holy Spirit within them. And so I just wanted to to pinpoint and to really focus on this situation concerning the wives just because of what Michal did in this situation. And, and while she did something good, I want to focus on the good thing because later on we're going to see something that I really can't praise her for. And so in verse 15 it says, Then Saul sent the messengers back to see David, saying, Bring him up to me in the bed that I may kill him. And when the messengers had come in, there was the Im image in the bed with a cover of goat's hair for his head. And then Saul said to Michal, why have you deceived me like this and sent my enemy away so that he has escaped? And Michal answered Saul, he said to me, let me go. Why should I kill you? And so we see here that Michal lied to save her life. But additionally, what we see in this lie, not only did she use it to save her life, but she also painted David in a negative light. And so now you see why I had to, why I had to praise her when she did something good in helping her husband to escape. Because here she, once again, painted him in a negative light. She, she said that he said to her, let her go. Why should I kill you? Almost making it seem like she tried to kill this man's daughter. And so he already hates David. He, are, he is already envious of David. And now you're going to make him think that, oh, he tried to kill my daughter as well. So, of course, this does not help David's case with Saul and sharing that lie that painted David in that way. And, of course, I... Uh, believe she felt she needed to respond that way because she saw that her father, Saul, was upset with her. And it's crazy that he would be upset with her because notice what he says. He, he says that she deceived him. Why did you deceive me? You sent my enemy away. You allowed him to escape. And, and that's so strange to me because Saul is the one who was doing wrong, and yet he is upset that someone else has wronged him. And, and don't, don't you notice that it's the same way today with many? That, that many who do wrong, they don't like to be wrong. In fact, they don't recognize the wrong in themselves. They don't recognize the sin in themselves, but they sure do know how to recognize the wrong or the sin in others. Oh, it's okay for me to do wrong to you, for me to sin against you, but don't do it against me. In verse 18, as we pick up in 1 Samuel 19, it says, so David fled and he escaped and he went to Samuel at Ramah, and he told him all that Saul had done to him. And he and Samuel went and stayed in Nioth. Now it was told Saul, saying, Take note, David is at Nioth in Ramah. And then Saul sent messengers, he sent agents to take David. And when he saw, and when they saw the group of prophets prophesying, and Samuel standing as leader over them, the Spirit of God came upon the messengers of Saul, and they also prophesied. And when Saul was told, he sent other messengers or agents, and they prophesied likewise. And then Saul sent messengers again, the Scriptures tell us, the third time, and they prophesied also. And then Saul himself, in verse 22, went to Ramah, and he came to the great well, or the cistern, that is at Seku. And so Saul asked and said, where are Samuel and David? 
And someone said, indeed, they are at Nioth in Ramah. And so he went there to Nioth in Ramah. And then the Spirit of God was upon him also. And he went on and prophesied until he came to Nioth and Ramah. And he also stripped off his clothes. This, this would be his royal robes and his armor. And he prophesied before Samuel in like manner. So the same way that his agents prophesied as the Spirit of God came upon them. And he lay down naked all that day and all that night. And so this doesn't necessarily mean that he was absolutely without clothing when it says he was naked. But according to one source, it says that a person was called naked whose outer garments were thrown aside, leaving nothing but the tunic and the girdle or the belt. So it doesn't necessarily mean that he was uh, totally naked. But, but continuing in the second part of verse 24, it, it says, Therefore they say, so people begin to say, Is Saul also among the prophets? And so as we've read and, and as we think about verses 18 through 24, some may wonder why Saul's messengers and even Saul were able to prophesy on their way to doing something bad. See, Saul really had no real commitment to the Lord. He was on his way to murder David, sent messengers to murder David, and yet and still the, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they were able to prophesy. How was that? How was that possible? Well, first, the, the Hebrew word behind prophesy, just to share what that means here, it has the idea, of course, of speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit, in other words, influenced them. But once again, how is that possible? And I just want to share with you that God is able to do things like this in spite of, in spite of people. Not, not because we're good, not because they were good or on their way to doing something holy, but in spite of them, God was able to do it. And you can get a glimpse of this in Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. Again, Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. So once again, we're going to see how God sometimes can work, can do whatever his will is in spite of people because Jesus says, uh, and beginning in verse 21 of Matthew 7, he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. So, so it's not someone who is giving lip service. They, they say, Lord, Lord, I love you, Lord, with their lips. They say, I am a Christian with their lips, but their hearts are far from him, are far from a committed relationship with the God of heaven. And so not everyone who say those words, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But once again, the one who does the will of my Father in heaven, many will say, to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Just like Saul, just like his messengers, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out demons in your name? Remember Judas, the one who betrayed Jesus, he was with the group as they, as they cast out demons, as they went out witnessing. But the scriptures tell us that, that, that Jesus knew from the beginning who he was. Because Jesus says, I have I've chosen 12 of you and one of you is a devil. So Jesus already knew what Judas, Jesus knew what Judas was about from the get go. And so God can work in spite of people in order to accomplish his will. But these, there are people who are going to say, we've done this and that in your name. We've cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name. But the Lord will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So these are not people who've lost their salvation. These are people who never really had a relationship with Jesus. They were never really born into the family of God. They were never really born again because he didn't say, I used 
used to know you. He said, I never knew you. You never had a relationship with me. The only reason they were able to do that is once again, because God chose to accomplish his purpose through them. If they prophesied in his name, if they cast out demons in his name. And so it's so important that we don't give lip service or be religious on the outside or punch the clock on the Sunday morning, on the Wednesday night, or just reading a few scriptures here and there, but missing out on a true relationship with God through Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about. But one thing I want to share with you in regard to Saul and these messengers, just to go back there, I just want to say that it also appears that God inspired these men to prophesy in order to protect David and to give him time to escape from Saul. And so God used that to give David some time to make it to an area of safety. So just with us knowing David and who he is, and for many of us, he's one of the, our, our most favorite characters real people, real characters in the Bible. In fact, in eternity, he's one of the people I would love to talk to. And one thing that we know about him is that he was just doing what he's supposed to do. He was a man who was after God's own heart. He had a heart that was committed to the Lord. And so he just focused on serving the Lord and he focused on serving the king and he served the Lord and he served the king, King Saul, well. We see from the studies that he experienced success. He experienced great success and and yet he has made an enemy in Saul. But we know that David had not sinned against Saul. Even Jonathan, his best friend and Saul's son, admitted that. But but yet Saul wanted to sin against David and kill him. So yes, David was innocent in this situation. But Saul, of course, wanted to kill him without a cause. And so a question I have for tonight is, where does murder start? As we see that Saul wanted to kill him, he wanted to murder him without a cause. But where does murder start? See, in 1 John 3.15, the scriptures say that whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. And so that murder is an outward growth of the hatred that is in the heart of another human being. And so, yes, it says in the scriptures technically that, that why do you want to kill David without a cause? But I go back to the root that Saul hated David without a cause. He hated David without a reason. And so he wanted to murder him. He wanted to kill him without a reason. So that, that, that murder, once again, starts with hatred in the heart. And it's so very important for us to check our, our heart attitudes. So what is the attitude in our heart? But one thing I like about the scriptures is that the scriptures in it, we see that there's information that is recorded about the greater than David, Jesus Christ. And one thing I want us to do is go to John chapter 15 to learn about this greater than David. And I bring up this greater than David, speaking of Jesus Christ, because Jesus can relate to him and what he was going through. So let's turn to John chapter 15. We're going to pick up at verse 18.
Jesus says here, Jesus says here in verse 18 of John 15, he says, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. He says, if you were of the world, the world would love his own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they would keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. They don't have a relationship with the father. He says, if I had not come and spoken to them, they would have no sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. So the more you know, in other words, the more responsible you are for obeying the word of God. And so that's why Jesus says that, that the servant who knew to do his will will be, but didn't do it will be beaten with many stripes. But the servant who didn't know will be beaten with fewer stripes. But he says, if I had not come and spoken to them, they would have no sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. They've heard the word. He, in verse 23 who hates me, hates my father also. It's impossible to say you love God, but hate Jesus. He says, if I have not done among them the works which no one else did, they would have no sin. But now they have seen and also hated both me and my father. But here we go. Verse 25. But this happened that the word might be fulfilled, which is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. And so, yes, King Saul wanted to kill. He wanted to murder David without a cause, but it was only because he hated David without a cause. Again, it goes back to hate. And here we see that Jesus can relate to that because they totally hated Jesus without a cause. And, and even as believers, as you see there, as Jesus shared in the word of God in, in, in John chapter 15, verses 18 through 25, we see that same thing happens to us as well. Those of us who put our faith, who put our trust in Jesus Christ, we see that the world too, they hate us. Why? Because they don't have a relationship with the one who sent Jesus Christ into the world to die for their sin. And so sometimes we don't have to do anything for the world to not like us. We don't have to do anything for the world to become our enemies. We don't have to do anything for the world to hate us. But it could be just the simple fact that God is with us and for the fact that God is in us. And it shows that he is with us and that he is in us. Therefore, we too could be hated without a cause, just like David was, just like Jesus was, hated without a cause. And, and does it feel good to be hated by the world, to be hated by anyone, even with a cause? No. But don't be surprised, Christian. Don't be surprised, brother in Christ. Don't be surprised, sister in Christ, if you are hated just for no reason. You're hated just because you carry your Bible. You hate it just because you love Jesus. You hate it just because you post scriptures on Twitter or whatever the case may be. You're hated because you wear those Christian shirts. You're hated because your license plate has some type of scripture on there or something that glorifies God. You hate it because you have a, you have a sticker on your car window. You hate it because you share with somebody John 3, 16. They hate you without a cause. And so I know it doesn't feel comfortable to be hated by the world, which is, of course, influenced by Satan. But I have to ask the question, would you rather be in opposition to God or be in opposition to the world, even if it's without a cause? Well, let me ask this question. Would you rather be a Christian who disagrees with Jesus or disagrees with the world. It was so fascinating to me. You have so many people who claim to be a believer, who claim to be a Christian, and yet and still they would disagree with something that Jesus says. This is plain as day in the scriptures, but they would still disagree with him.
But finally, as we close, and I apologize for the mic, but finally as we close, as the worship team comes to the stage, Jesus tells us how to treat the haters. And Jesus is so clear about how we treat the haters. And I know it's so easy to get along with people who like you, with people who love you, with people who are in your inner circle, with people at church who love the same Jesus that you love. It's so easy. But Jesus also tells us how to treat people who believe differently than we do, people who hate us. And so in Matthew 5, verses 43 through 45, it says, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But Jesus says, But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless or speak well of those who curse you, those who invoke evil upon you. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who spitefully or abusively use you and persecute you. That you may be sons of your father in heaven. And it says, for he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good. And he sends rain on the just and on the unjust. And so I know you may have a lot of people in the world, a lot of people who have been expressive in their hate for you, especially in this culture that we're living in. But love your enemies, Jesus said. Bless those who curse us. Bless those who call us bigots and homophobes, whatever they want to call us. Fairy tale believers. I don't know, you fill in the blank. You know the stuff people say. Whatever they call us, bless those. Do good to those who hate us. Oh, those are some heavy words. Pray for those who abuse us and persecute us. You see, when you pray for people who treat you wrong, Oh, it's hard to hate them back. It's hard to hate someone or not have love for someone that you're praying for. So pray for them. And when we do these things, it shows that we're sons of our Father in heaven. It shows that we're really His children. Because God does this. And it, and it demonstrates that in this saying where he says, because God, he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. And so we can do that too. No, we can't make it rain. We, we can't, we, we don't own a sun to make the sun rise. But we can love our enemies. We could do good to those who hate us just like we do good to those who love us. But the good news is that we don't have to do this on our own. And he's not asking us to do this on our own. But because we have the Holy Spirit indwelling us, all we have to do is surrender to him and he'll help us to do what seems impossible in this lesson when it comes to the treatment of those what I call haters. And so I know that this is a timely word for what we're dealing with today in this culture. But we're going to ask God to help us to surrender to his spirit and help us to get to this place that Jesus wants us to be. So, Father, we thank you for tonight. We thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit who indwells us. We pray, Lord, that you'll help us to be obedient to you. 
May your love overflow from us, Lord. We can't do it on our own. We can't stir this love up on our own. We need you, Lord. But let us not forsake the truth because we are told to speak the truth in love. So, Lord, help us to rely on you for whatever it is you called us to do. We love you. We praise you. We give you thanks. And I ask your blessing upon my brothers and sisters throughout the remainder of this week that you would use them, that you would bless them, that, Lord, you would hear their cry as they lift up prayers to you, Lord. And as we leave this place, but never your presence, may you bless them with traveling grace. In Jesus' precious name, amen.